Would you, was the job what you thought it was? Oh, well, Jersey? are you talking about the academy? Because the no, best it, part about being a recruit three times was realizing how awful the training was on every fucking front. This is going to hurt. It's time, it's time for, the for the Suffering Podcast. 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 Support for the Suffering Podcast is brought to you by Manscaped, who's the best in men's below-the-waist grooming. The products are precision-engineered tools for your family jewels. Manscaped Performance Package is the ultimate men's hygiene bundle. Inside the package, you'll find the Lawnmower 4.0, Weed Whacker Ear Nose Hair Trimmer, and the Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant. And we also got the Crop Reviver Ball Toner. This is a, this thing is a life changer. Along with that, boxer briefs. I'm going to tell you what these are. These are like high quality boxer briefs, and I'm, this is no joke. I'm not saying this just because their manscape sent it to us. These are nice. My boys are going to be quite happy in there. You can't tell Kevin's wearing them under the table right now. <laughs> and we also have a nice travel package. Join over eight million men worldwide who trust Manscape with this exclusive offer just for you. Twenty percent off and free worldwide shipping with the code TSP at Manscape.com. Jesus Christ, that's a lot of balls. <laughs> but it, that, that shit hurts, man. Oh, yeah, like I, that's terrible. so that's that's an argument that that I use when people want to get their carry. The regular civilian wants to get their carry permit. I said, get, get yourself a can of OC spray. It, it'll do. You, you can use it a lot more freely, and it'll do a lot more damage than than you think it will do. It won't do. It won't do more damage than a gun. But this shit hurts. Yeah, I don't know if, if civilians need to be getting pumped up to start deploying OC spray when they feel like danger is near. Oh, no. Whenever I explain that to people, I said, just take a little bit on your thumb and put it right above your eyelid. That'll give you an appreciation for when you need to deploy it and when you don't need to deploy yeah, it. Yeah, and then you go home and take a shower, Ooh. and it comes back again, and oh, it's oh, terrible. Man. So I sprayed at uh, two of my three academies, and we were <clears throat> gassed at, at the last two. Yeah. Uh, and we caught the gas bad in the third one, and I, I got to tell you, I'll take the spray all day over the gas. Really? All day. See, I, I well, I, I was I thought I was Mr. Big Balls in the academy, and we didn't have to do the gas at the time. They were phasing gas out, so they put it in the in the middle of the basketball court, and I go over there, and I was smoking at the time, and I go over there and I take a big, man, that was the worst thing I ever yeah, did. Bad. That was it freezes your lungs up. Oh, it's, it's awful, dude. It's bad. But you know, when you're a young cop, you well, at the th- at the last academy, this is in 05, um, they actually took vice grips, popped the ones they do for, uh, like for crowd dispersing. And held it. They made us line up, and they this thing covers like I don't know thousands of square feet of space. And they ran it into your face, just a billowing <laughs> smoke into your. It was nuts. The things were. That's why they use vice grips. The thing was piping red hot, and they just come along like they were like just smoking your face out. And dude, I you know everybody lost their minds. The instructors were like, calm down, calm down. They're screaming. We were fucking hitting fences, running into but fucking the telephone poles. The instructors have gas masks. Yeah, they have gas masks on. Yeah, they're tough guys. <clears throat> you know, it's funny when people say, well, you know, why do I have to get sprayed with OC? In order to carry it. And he said, well, you know, you got to know the effects. Well, I carry a gun and you're not going to shoot me. Yeah. Well, I got to be honest with you. I, I think it's important to get sprayed. I think so, I, too. I, I, So I, you don't freak out. Well, yeah. I've been sprayed, I don't know, about f- fucking 14 times because Easy. obviously people are going to deploy spray in a fight. Um, so I've been – the cool thing is for our agency, they actually spent the money on the uh, antidote. So as long as – I usually – I can't tell how many times I parked my car. The I, antidote? Yeah, yeah. So you get right, So I got shot back to police headquarters multiple occasions. And then they have uh, they have one wash goes in your face, and the next one is another pump. It's a it's like a wash, and a, it's almost like a shampoo and conditioner, and uh, it's done. It's over. Ba- Takes it out in like literally twenty seconds. They, they generally tell you copious amounts of water. No, no, they actually have an antidote. <laughs> the for The eye flush it. station. It's expensive, it. so they left it in the armory, so nobody can <clears throat> touch it. I think it's like three hundred dollars a gallon. So the the stuff that we use was just baby so Johnson's baby soap. Oh, they got the stuff that that's I think Saber makes it or somebody, yeah. and it's you can buy it, and it's literally. Pepper spray antidote. I think, we and need, it's immediate. I think we need to test that. There's no oils, salves. You know, I, let I, you I really like think that. that we need to test it. It's fantastic. Well, when they got want, it, yeah, why don't we? Why don't we spray this room up one day and just do a yeah, show in here? I'm sure, Andrew, will you guys love can that. tell me all about it. <laughs> <laughs> so when you got that, when you finally now was being a street cop is what you wanted to do. Obviously, a lot of oh, people yeah. will join corrections because they want to get on the road. Well, dude, people don't realize that in the state of New Jersey at that time, getting a cop job is like. Impossible. Yeah, it's yeah. the most competitive job if market you, in New Jersey. If you didn't get a, 90, was, if you didn't get a ninety-nine or a hundred on the test, you weren't even nuts. on the list. It was crazy, and you had, had to hit you it had the right to, time. It was, you had to go to like Del Bagno. You had to go to, yeah, to, to all anywhere. those different prep courses. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it took me three times taking the civil service test to get to, to hit. 
Um, you know, in the interim, I was I didn't want to be in corrections. Uh, I realized about the second day I was there that I better go back to college <laughs> because uh, this was this was not a place where I intended to be for very long. And I was pot committed, so I was taking literally every test that I get my hands on. And you know, I took a job at the U.S. Park Police, and I had no idea what they were. I didn't give a shit. All I knew was I'd have to go to a housing unit on a beautiful summer day and sit in with 48 inmates in a disgusting place for eight to 16 mandatory hours of the shift. And doesn't every jail smell the same? Oh, it's awful. Yeah. It smells like- you got that, you I'll got be a, honest with you, dude. I, I jail stink. I don't know if there's anything I wouldn't do before I went back to being a corrections officer. And I, I, not that I had a hard time. It's just the worst job I ever had. It taught me a lot. And the people who do it, I give a lot of credit to. I wasn't like losing my mind over it. It just, for a guy like me, it was brutal. It was torture because it was boring. Um, and I, you know, I'm an outdoors guy being stuck inside. I'm not lazy. I'm a, I'm, I'm a brain that needs to constantly be doing something. Uh, so it literally just almost was the opposite of what I ever needed to, to have. You, there was nothing. You learned good communication skills. But outside of that and recognizing some crime, people say, oh, you know, this, this is the correction officer to police statement that we all hear. I think the best cops were corrections officers first because you get the experience. And I'm like, yeah, I don't – I know a lot of good cops. They weren't corrections officers first. Mike Arena actually opened my eyes to something. He said he wasn't allowed to bring food, his own food in there. There wasn't like a – Oh, yeah, cafeteria. you can't. Yeah. That's um, insane to me. I don't want these guys making uh, my wild, food. Dude. It's a wild – it's a wild – honestly – it is the worst job that you could possibly think of. Well, Kevin, I mean, someone like you who's who's gluten free too. Forget you know, it. What I mean, would you be able to do? I would. I would fast. That's all I would do is fast. Because what am I? I'm not having these guys. I don't like. I don't like anybody touching my food anyway. No, no less somebody who I'm in charge of guarding. Yeah, dude. It's it's it is not a good place to be. And it's the only job that I have PTSD from. I have <laughs> nightmares of being in jail. Yeah, you're locked. You're you're a prisoner for eight to twelve hours. Well, I always say corrections officers are, are more inmates than the inmates are, because the inmates could roam free. You got your post. You got to stay right there. Uh, well, it's a lot of a lot of dynamic to it, <clears> but it is a very difficult job. And uh, you know, I, I admire and and, and thank yeah. the men and women that do it because. I would never do it Take, again. It takes a special person to be a corrections officer. Well, it really people, does. I mean, like I said, I don't want people to think that we're, we're putting down corrections officers or corrections no, itself. No, no. It's a job I don't it, want to do. Yeah. It, and and they're doing it. I don't want to be an Alaskan crab fisherman it, either. It, it, just like yeah, firemen. Not, not just like firemen. I don't want to be a fireman. Nope. <laughs> when you got into the park police, was it a little bit more freeing? You kind of breathed a little bit easier? Oh, dude. I, I, I remember getting the call in the jail when I was getting hired. I, uh, dude, it's a crazy story. So I encourage one of my coworkers to take the test with me. I'm like, dude, let's get the fuck out of here. Smart guy. You know, I, I, you're a good friend of mine. So he took the test and they were hiring 24. Brian was one of the first 24. I was number 25. So the ironic thing was that he was getting hired and I'm the one who told him to take it and I wasn't. So he had already gotten ready and prepared and did his two weeks notice. And uh, I got a call and they were like, hey, what's your shoe size and your belt size? And I'm like, why? And they're like, I'm like, am I going to the academy? And they're like, yeah, 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 you're hired. And I'm like, oh, shit. And this is like, on, I remember it being uh, maybe like eight. It was later. It was like eight o'clock at night. My shift ended at 10, maybe. And uh, or maybe six o'clock at night, something like that. Because I, then I, my break, I walked down to the shift commander's office and I said, hey, Mike, how many, uh, how many vacation days do I have left to, to burn on sick days? Because you have two weeks. I go, I literally put my hand out. I said, it was a pleasure working with you. I think you're a great guy. Where do you want me to type my two weeks notice? He goes, there's a typewriter right there. So I typed it up and it to him and said, this will be my last shift. And uh, it was nice working with you. Wow. And that was it, dude. And um, I can't express to you how thankful I was to be done with going to work there. It was literally one of the worst jobs of my life. So do you understand, as we were walking in here, <laughs> you were joking to me like, yeah, I, you know, I'm ready to suffer. I'm ready to suffer. You already went through it. Oh. You went through it. My whole life's been suffering. <laughs> so you finally get that job and you move on to the police job. Now you got what you want. Yeah, except I'm in D.C. And I didn't, and in 2004, well, police still had respect. And I still think they have respect. But they had a lot of respect in New Jersey. Being a cop in D.C. is like being a janitor. They fucking hate the cops there. They fucking hate the police. So, um, you know, I was like, this place is nuts. And I hated D.C. It had no culture. I still hate D.C. Uh, I think it's a. I think it's just a wild place that I have no interest in being in. Uh, it's you know I travel the country. It's not my favorite place to be. Uh, I don't like the attitude and the be and the the feeling of the separation of people there. It's a very very segregated. No bullshit. Even though it's supposed to be like the epicenter of brotherhood, yeah. no, I, it is a very yeah. segregated place. 
and not one person is responsible for it. It's just, it's a weird thing, especially coming from a state where we're not segregated. You've got more friends, and I've got more friends that are Chinese, black, Puerto Rican, Spanish. You know, like we are friends with everybody. See, right there, right there. behind the glass. So to go somewhere where people <laughs> weren't comfortable with each other or friendly towards each other was very weird for me. I could not handle that because, dude, you know how it is here, bro. <laughs> Probably, you know, I mean, you could go to my backyard party on the Fourth of July, and there's just a looks like United Nations. But that's that's amazing. So most people's experience of DC is the mall. You know, in Congress building, in the White House, and, and people don't realize that D.C. is is really bad when you venture outside of those areas, and um, the dichotomy in there. So you could bring your family there and not know D.C. is one of the most dangerous cities in the world. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, growing up too. I mean, Atlantic City. Well, well you go down into a uh, yeah. two very so, different. Things. So different. Atlantic uh, D.C.'s have it. I mean, when I was there, they do a homicide a day. Yeah, it's so different like, with Atlantic City. A homicide a day. Guy, guy went to the police academy, Bergen County Police Academy, was a D.C. Metro cop. He had like four four shootings under his belt. Jesus. Oh, I'm sure. And he came back to Bergen County, and like you said, they made him do the whole academy again. Ooh. So <sighs> what 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 drove you to leave that? Just because you hated. DC? Well, dude, first of all, the pay, the pension, mm-hmm. uh, the opportunity. I mean, it was. I mean, they were paying into benefits in '04. The the pension system was like 30 percent after 25 years. It took 28 years in '04 when everybody was three to five year top pays. Mm-hmm. It took 28 years to go to top pay. If you got oh. promoted to sergeant, you didn't go to sergeant's pay. You went to a guy who has six years on the job as a sergeant. It's like an $800 pay it's increase. Like pro rated. Oh, wow. it's ridiculous. So I was like, I remember sitting there going through the process, and I'm like, they're like, pick a health plan. And I'm like, why? And they're like, because you got to figure out which one you want. I'm like, what difference does it make? Well, they're like, well, they have different prices on them. And I'm like, what do you mean? Like, yeah, you got to pay into your benefits here. So it said, the ad said starting at forty six thousand, tops at ninety eight thousand. I'm like, oh, it's top paid five years, ninety eight thousand. This could be a good gig right at that time. And they're like, no, it's twenty eight years to top pay. Wow. That's a lot of steps. Years. That's a lot of steps. DC's right not a. It's an expensive place it's to just be. Expensive here. Yeah. It's, yeah. You no, know, it's not. It's not cheaper. It's not like you're going down to the, the deep south. So I just knew that for me. I am never satisfied, and I'm always looking for what the next best move is. And that's advice I give to people is people say, what should I do next? Well, you know, as long as you're doing something better than the last step. It doesn't have to be your final step. Just figure out where you're going next. Small advancement? I, I think that's life. How could you look for a large advancement? You'd be looking forever. So it's one foot in front of the other. You know, one hand over the mouth. Uh, you know, cl- as you climb, one hand over the other. And, um, you know, I, I was willing to go back to the academy. And I never forget before I left Park Police, uh, I sat with a major dude in exit interview. And boy, we could have gave him what I really felt about the place. And he said, I'm going to tell you this right now. Be careful what you say in this exit interview because we can take you back for a year. And if things don't work out where you go or you get hurt, we'll put you back in patrol immediately. Come back down here. We'll get you back in patrol. You go right back to work. You don't even got to qualify because you're still qualified for six months. So whatever you write on that, if you write something bad, they're not going to take you back, just so you know. He goes, that's between you and I. So I just, I was like, all right, let me just play it smart and just write like, yeah, things are fantastic. Um, but I remember him saying, like, if you don't want to be in the academy, you decide to quit, we'll have you back on the road. Literally just call me up and we'll have you right back on, on work. They were low on manpower too. So, and I remember being out in Somerset, you know, January 12th at 6 a.m. with now a hundred pound rucksack, uh, you know, holding it, my hands turning literally purple because it's so cold. I'm holding this bag so long. And it's funny is a couple of my friends were the drill instructors. They didn't know I was in the academy. So they came running around. You know, I'm four and a half years on the job now at this point. Right, four and a half. Yes, yeah, so about four and a half years I have on. And um, so they're running back up and they're screaming. They're like, oh my God, what are you doing here? I'm like, just yell at me. Just yell at me. Don't. In the first bathroom break I got, that's when they were talking. They're like, you know, they're like, dude, I didn't know you're going to be here. And I'm like, yeah, just don't fucking play it off. Like, we're fr- just, yeah, like, yell. I don't, like, whatever you got to do, dude. Like, I don't, you don't could treat me any differently. And it was fun to have them in the academy as instructors because I used to work with them. But, you know, going back to what we were talking about earlier, I've ha- I personally think I had one of the best drill instructors. Where'd you I, go, Bergen? I went to Essex. Okay. I had the, a guy named Jimmy Marinara. I had He was a force recon Marine, very serious, and he, w- he would make us do things which I used to think were very torturous. You know, uh, hold your – I, I thought I was in good shape, but hold your arms up to the sides for a very long time, and you just watch your arms shake, and you're like, it's painful. But what he was doing was if you're in a critical situation and you got to hold your gun up 
you know, who used to make us hold our gun up like this. You got to hold your gun up forever. Well, you know, that, that can be a benefit to you down the road or make you swim across the gym floor in your uniform. Well, that's what's going to happen during a critical incident. And it wasn't until I got out of the academy that I saw a lot of the benefit and value. But here's the, here's the main thing with him. And it goes back to the social media question. He never asked us to do anything he was unwilling to do himself. There was a guy at the range that would yell and scream at us, and he was this big, fat guy. He, he, you know, he, he didn't look the part of a cop. He loved to torture us just for the sake of torturing us. This guy, whatever we did, he did. Whatever the punishment was, he did it to show that it was possible. He led by example, and he was somebody that really, really impressed me. But that, that, that fat guy, isn't that a form of bullying? A hundred percent, hundred Because they, they, you know, they're insecure about themselves, so they want to make you do something that they, they can't do. You know, I always said that when, he, like I said, I was a PT instructor, I and I was a you know football coach, and I ran the uh, the off con, uh, off season conditioning. I did every drill with those kids, of course, just to show them I could still do it. Mm-hmm. I was still running at the police academy at fifty five years old, just to show these these twenty two and twenty three old Bergen County. Okay, I used to, just to show them. Where'd you work? Lynnhurst. Okay, just to show them if I could do it at fifty-five, you should be able to do it at twenty-two, twenty-three years old. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, and and you you dumb it down. And I take it to in every aspect of my life. It's I'm, I rarely will ever ask anybody I'm un- something I'm unwilling to do myself. I will outwork most people in the world to my abilities, mm-hmm. um, just to show you that it's possible. Mm-hmm. It is possible. And you see that a lot with supervision in law enforcement. They'll tell you, "Go do this. Go do that. Go do this." Because they don't want to do it themselves. When I was this, when you know, I retired as a lieutenant, I used to tell the guys, "Come on, let's go do this." That's right. You know, we got a call. Let's go do it. That's right. Not so, you go do this. You go do that. I was just watching Jocko Willink <clears throat> on a podcast, and if you ever do get him for street cop training, I need to be your guest because he, he's <laughs> he. Listen, he's a he's a genuinely good leader. He was just on a show, and he says, "You know how many times I told somebody do this and do that?" He goes zero. I did that zero. Here's what I would do. I would go, okay, we got a problem. Let's make a plan up. Talk to me. Let's go back and forth. And that's how a leader, a leader leads from the front. But then you get, you, so you get into Somerset. Was it what you thought it was? Was the job what you thought it was? Oh, well, Jersey? are you talking about the academy? Because the no, best it, part about being a recruit three times was realizing how awful the training was on every fucking front. Um, it's, it's such an opportunity for four to six months, wherever state you're going to be in, to really train and we completely drop the fucking ball and nothing gets done. You get literally dick. So everybody's told the same thing. Hey, you're going to go to the academy. You're not going to learn a thing. And guess what? They deliver on that promise. You don't learn a fucking thing in the academy. You know, I, I learned how to clean a handgun. That was cool, right? I learned a real. I still use the same technique that the guy in Bergen County did, the guy who worked the range out there. I like that guy, Scott something or some shit. Scott Williams. Yeah, yeah. So, I, listen, I like that guy. He was cool. It was fun. It was enjoyable. I learned how to clean a gun. He had his way. I still use it the same way. Uh, but outside of that, how did we spend six months in the academy and learn literally nothing that's useful? Nothing. Zero. You had people training that had no idea what they were talking about. Most of them. Because uh, it's more about liability than It has nothing safety. to do with liability. It has to do with saying they did something. And so that's what I, I imagine when you made an academy curriculum, whatever part of this country, and, and I'm guessing in the late 60s, early 70s, when academies started becoming mandatory, when somebody wrote this program, I could only imagine what that conversation was like, hey, Kev, I don't know, Mike, what do you think we got to do this fucking academy? The fucking politicians want it. What are we going to do? I don't know. What's on your belt? Uh, you got a pair of handcuffs? Hey, do, a, do a four-hour block on handcuffs. Well, what are you going to talk about? I don't know. Talk about the fucking ratchet, where the key goes, the chain. Do a little five-person quick question on that. What else you got? Ah, you got the pistol, right? Yeah. I don't know. What do you Make him shoot or something? Yeah, make him shoot. I don't know. Let's come up with some bullshit. Uh, how about that stick on your belt? Yeah, we'll talk about the stick. We'll make him swing a stick in a bag for 15, 20 hours. Guys, we've got another 100 hours left to fill in. What else you want to do? Ah, with the stick. Make a make a make a slide about the stick and a five question quiz about what the parts of the stick are. Well, is this gonna help anybody in the street? No. Georgia State takedown. You remember that one with the PR twenty four? Yeah, PR twenty. Oh, like you slide your thing up and it's like a it's like a six point movement that Fucking you will hard. never do. Never. I don't know anybody who's done a Georgia State takedown with a PR twenty four. Remember being a new recruit at Bergen County, and I said to uh, the I don't want to say his name because I do like the guy. Uh, they were teaching pressure points. And I'm like, I'm like, I said to him, I go, would this stuff ever actually work in real life? And he literally said, probably not. Was, was it a doctor? No. Oh. Yeah. So, <laughs> uh, you know, it's it just, it was, 
it was very so at the end, I'm like, why did we spend all this? How did I go through 77 weeks of academies? And I will give credit where credit's due. The Federal Law Enforcement Training Center was the better of the three. They had some real thoughtful programs, which I appreciated. That's the only academy where I actually got some real skills, uh, like high-intensity training. So like we were doing you know, uh, use of force with high-intensity physical training. Then we were doing move and shoot. That was really important. We were doing officer down shooting, low light shooting. The driving training there was fantastic. They have a lot of unlimited resources. I mean, you want to talk about learning how to drive? Those motherfuckers will teach you how to drive at that academy because I can drive. And then I come here. I'm at the third academy. And, like, they're setting up cones at the fucking Rutgers parking lot. And they're like, all right, you could only go up to about 32 miles an hour. You have to slam the brakes. That's as fast as we can go on this track. This is real life pursuit training, right? This is real life you set up cones in a parking lot. Like, what are we talking about here? So it's funny you say that because my drill was very, very tactically oriented. Was it called the Iron Cross? Remember that? Some shit like yeah. that. He was very tactically oriented. And I remember he, he had a lot of pushback from the administration and the academy of some of the things that he was doing. He taught high-risk motor vehicle stops. He taught, you know, he did, he was very focused on PT. He was very focused on discipline because these are all the things that are going to, that are going to teach you how to survive out on the street. And I remember you could see it. You could see there was discussions going on and, you, you know, his hands are going up going pretty much saying, well, why can't I do this? This is the stuff that they're going to need and they're going to learn. Everything he did had a purpose. And, uh, you know, it's funny you said, looking back in retrospect, you're right. You know, I, I think the problem with the academies is the PTC guidelines. Well, the PTC tells you what you have to teach, and you have to get out point A, point B, point C. Right, because— And it's very, very—it's it's very static. You can't take status quo or the bare minimum when you're teaching people how to protect life. Yeah. And there has to be more thought. The problem is— is it's so political, everybody's got their sandbox, and nobody's willing to relinquish some of what they've got to say to somebody, hey, we know it's bad. <laughs> Do you have any thoughts and ideas on how to fix this? Nobody's willing to listen. So that's where the company came from. Is We're not waiting for your politicians to fix things. We're not waiting for somebody who doesn't know how to fix it to show up and try to fix it. Of course we're just fixing it. We're talking about street cop training. Well, that's like the whole thing, man. So how do you how do you – how do we expect a professional law enforcement officer to appear magically when we give him nothing to work with? Especially in this day and age sure. where the, hev the heavily scrutinized How much atmosphere. case load you learn in the academy? Not a lot. None. No. How about none? No, uh, a guy named Donnie Allen who was, a, who was a cop next town over who was really into case law. It was like his hobby. He got me into case law. Okay. Yeah, that's – but, but that, wasn't, none, right? that wasn't in the academy. That was right. that was after the academy. Well, I think you learned the only time you really learned case law is when they were talking about like, like breathalyzer before the alcohol test. Yeah, we but we didn't get that in the academy though. I didn't anymore. No, 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 yeah. we didn't get in the academy yeah. either. But oh yeah, 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 you're right. It's that was a that was a um, in service training. Mm -hmm. I went yeah. to three academies. Case law wasn't talked about once. 